It is difficult to predict the extent of self-governance which the man of the future may reach or the heights to which he may carry his technique. Social construction and psychophysical self-education will become two aspects of one and the same process. All the arts, literature, drama, painting, music and architecture will lend this process beautiful form. More correctly, the shell in which the cultural construction, self-education and communist man will be enclosed will develop all the vital elements of contemporary art to the highest points. Man will become immeasurably stronger, wiser and subtler. His body become more harmonized, his movements more rhythmic, his voice more musical. The forms of life will become dynamically dramatic and the average human will rise to the heights of an Aristotle, a Gautier or a Marx. And above this ridge, new peaks will rise. Trotsky wrote that in the 20s. And I wanted to open with that quote because I want to end this event on a note of profound optimism. In part, because I'm sure I'm going to upset some people, everyone has an opinion about art. Uh, you can't help but have an opinion about art. And I'm going to talk about what, in my view, should be the Marxist approach to the question of art and culture. But what I want us to bear in mind is that we're thinking about the levels to which human culture can be raised. We're thinking about unleashing the potential of humanity. Now, how do Marx understand art and culture? The history of humanity and class struggle is driven by the pursuits of the necessities of life. And art isn't a necessity in the same way that food, water, and shelter are all necessities. We don't need to look at paintings to not die, uh, or starve to death, or freeze to death, strictly speaking. And we certainly can't make art, really, until some of the basics of life are provided for. But humans have been creating art for basically as long as we've existed as a species. So I would say that art is a necessity in the sense that we are driven inexorably to create it. And really, no life worth living could do without it. Uh, Marx writes that the life of the working class begins when the working day ends. What does a worker actually care about? The miserable eight hours he spends being exploited, or the film he watches after work, or the book he reads, or the film that uh, he goes to the cinema to watch, or the play that he goes to watch. This is real life. And culture, separate from us, is all that's been created, assimilated, and achieved by man throughout the course of history, all the tools, buildings, machines, all the objective means and results of production. But culture also consists of ideas, skills, science, customs, and arts. And we assimilate and build upon the culture of past generations, developing and redeveloping it and passing it on to the next generation. And only humans can really do this, or at least to this level of complexity. No other animals can. And while we now have advanced AI tools that try to imitate human creativity, they're, they're pretty limited to say the least. They can't really produce original ideas. Um, my, my, my wife loves playing around with one of these programs called Stable Diffusion. And it, obviously reflects the bias of the images fed to it. So it's really good at drawing pretty anime girls, but it can't really do much else reliably. And it's much more effective if you add each prompt within the style of Dali, Picasso, what have you. And I really think this goes to demonstrate in, in a microcosmic sense that in art, as in everything else, human labor, physical or mental, is the only thing that, that can create new values. And that's true of art as well. So what is art then? Trotsky describes science as a way of understanding the world as a system of laws and art as a grouping of feelings. And you'll know what uh, I mean if you've ever admired a beautiful painting or been moved by a piece of music. The work of art is stirring emotions in you. And this is the basic function of art, which has taken many forms and served many ends over the course of history. And I do believe there's such a thing as progress and development in art, and I think there are two sides to it. On the one hand, there's the more or less objective question of technique, which is related to science, technology, refinement of methods. Just to offer one example, Pythagoras used a monochord, a single string of instruments, little more than a wire between two pins, to study musical intervals, differences in pitch, in relation to the ratios of vibrating strings of different lengths. And much later, you have a development upon this idea with the polyphonic keyboards, which was perfected in the Renaissance. It's the same mathematical principle, the different string lengths produce different intervals when twanged, returning at a higher level with better instruments like the piano that could achieve greater compositional complexity than the monochords. But 
there's another subjective side to artistic development, and that's the increasing maturity of ideas. If you were to give a Neolithic man Mozart's piano, he wouldn't have written The Marriage of Figaro. Give it 100 years, he wouldn't have written The Marriage of Figaro. The idea would not occur to him. The kind of culture and society capable of producing a piece of art like this just exists on a totally different level. And the subjective side of artistic development is really just as important as the development of technique. And both, of course, are dialectically interrelated, and I'll demonstrate later in the uh, lead-off. I would say, as part of culture, in general, art advances based on the progressive development of the productive forces, while in general, it enters crisis and stagnation when the mode of production reaches an impasse. But it'd be very mechanical for us to stop there. The question is far from straightforward. As Marx explains, I quote, as regards art, it is well known that some of its peaks by no means correspond to the general development of society, nor do they therefore to the material substructure. And sometimes decline and collapse in society can actually inspire important developments in art. To see this in action, take, for example, the hell panel from Hieronymus Bosch's remarkable triptych painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, painted between 1490 and 1510 during a period of decline and crisis of feudalism. And this nightmarish image of damnation shows a world ripped apart by madness, with people consumed by abstract figures that defy all sense of logic. And this was an unconscious expression of a mood in society, as a mode of production was coming to an end, becoming irrational. And this irrationality found its way unconsciously to Bosch's paintbrush. The development of surrealism as well in the period of organic capitalist crisis in the 1930s also produced very fine work, which similarly expressed the nightmare of capitalism in a state of senile decay with literally nightmarish dreamlike imagery. Trotsky actually wrote a very good manifesto for revolutionary art with the surrealist artist Andre Breton. So there can be peaks during periods of decline, but today, I think we are living through a general crisis of bourgeois culture. I just came out of a talk, a very good talk, um, about how bourgeois science and philosophy have become infected with all sorts of mystical, pessimistic, and inward-looking ideas. And in art, I think there's been a daft of new ideas as the capitalists squeezed tried and tested formulas for greater profits. Now, worthy art continues to be made. I'm not going to be accused of phobiaism here. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as good art under a capitalist crisis. Good art will always be made in the same way that there will always be advances in science while the general nature of bourgeois philosophy decays. But I would say because bourgeois culture is rife with cynicism and charlatanry, that reflects itself in art. And artists and workers in creative industries are also increasingly exploited and at the mercy of the market. And I would say there is nothing more annihilating to the creative human spirit than living under a system rotten right for overthrow. So the development of art is a measure of the development of civilization. Uh, not a direct one, an indirect one. Starting with the division of labour. So before the Neolithic Revolution, which was the point where you have settled communities and agriculture and the emergence of class society, um, before then there, there, there was no class society, no division of labour, and also no differentiation between arts, work, religion, science, it was all kind of mixed up. And cave art from this period actually depicts very few human figures, very few people. It mostly consists of highly detailed illustrations of animals. And the anthropologist Golden Child speculates that these paintings were a form of art magic, believed to give hunters mystical control over their quarry. So this art was purposeful. It was entirely purposeful. It's only with the rise of slave society, which freed an elite class to think and plan culture on a higher level, that art begins to take on more of a life of its own. Now, the oldest existing piece of what we might call literature, I would say, is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a series of poems written in the Akkadian language of the first ancient empire of Mesopotamia about 4,000 years ago. And it's not a strictly religious or historical text, it's a tragedy about a mythical, semi-mythical Sumerian hero, a divine king of Uruk. And after losing his best friend to an illness, he goes on a series of quests where he tries and fails many times to become immortal. 
Only the elite of Mesopotamian society at that time would have read this story. And it contains a clear moral message. No matter how great you are, you will die one day. And that's still quite an important uh, and common message in art. And this unresolved, somber story was highly influential on the, uh, the tragic heroes of ancient Greek mythology, or at least the ancient Greeks came to similar conclusions in their art. And these developments represent, I would say coherently, the emergence of human beings through art for the first time. And it was also concurrent with the push towards realism in all art forms. If you look at Greek and Roman sculpture, it literally looks like real people are fighting to emerge from the marble. Um, after the collapse, though, of the Western Roman Empire, in Europe at least, important techniques in architecture, textiles, stonemasonry, and so on, were simply lost, along with literally complex writing systems in huge swathes of the continent. So you go from Virgil to illiteracy in an entire swathe of the continent in just a few centuries. It was different elsewhere, uh, particularly in Byzantium, the Middle East, and Asia. Arts like poetry, architecture, painting, and so on continue to develop, but I have to admit I'm not an expert in these traditions. Perhaps that can come out of the discussion later. But the so-called migration era, it's a euphemism really, dark ages is a more appropriate term in my view. Um, and the Middle Ages plunged Western Europe into a millennium of barbarism in which the church built up a spiritual dictatorship over culture, denying independent thoughts. And you see this reflected in art. I'll go out on a limb here. I don't think that medieval drawings are just different from Roman frescoes. I think they're worse. If you compare the lively, vibrant, and technically accurate Roman frescoes with medieval drawings, all the people have the same face, the same dopey, upcast eyes. There's no internal content but dull deference towards their god and their king. Their humanity has been stripped away. But even under these conditions, a handful of exceptional artists managed to fight back, vent their frustration, and produce really excellent arts. <laughs> Geoffrey Chaucer, for example, the father of English literature, came from a bourgeois background. He was um, the son of a wine merchant, whose name actually comes from the French word for stocking maker. Uh, he despised corruption in the church. And because his family had the ear of the king, because he used to provide them with, with his wines, uh, he was indulged a lot more than most in making his feelings known. So, has anyone here read the Canterbury Tales? A couple. Oh, awful. You should all read it. In the Summoner's Prologue, uh, he talks of a friar who goes to hell. And the friar, finding himself alone, assumes that's because friars are all such good Christians that all the rest must be in heaven. But then, I quote, just as the bees come swarming from a hive, out of the devil's asshole there did drive <laughs> full 20,000 friars in a rout, and through all hell they swarmed and ran about. Which fairly succinctly describes Chaucer's feelings about the stifling nature of the religious establishment. And it's no accident that Chaucer was an early representative of the bourgeois class, who would eventually overthrow feudalism and transform culture in their image. The Gothic style, I think, is a sort of missing link in which the bourgeois were turning their backs on the squalor and ignorance of feudalism back to the wonders of antiquity, uh, which had actually been preserved by the Muslim world uh, for inspiration. And Trotsky explains that the great bourgeois cultural revolution, which we call the Renaissance, only began when the new social class, already culturally satiated, felt itself strong enough to come out from under the yoke of the Gothic arch and to use the technique of the past for its own artistic aims. And the Renaissance is a good demonstration of what I mentioned earlier, this dialectical relationship between the technical, the objective, if you like, and the more subjective development in art. Take, for instance, the invention of the printing press. Mechanized printing reflected the development of capitalism, which is increasingly striving for mechanical production, pushing aside arduous, inefficient, handmade methods. And the bourgeoisie at this time were also feverishly seeking out ideas to devour, which fed a demand for a faster method of reproducing literature than time-consuming hand copying. Books during the uh, Middle Ages were very expensive. Um, they were handwritten. And the church and the aristocracy had an effective monopoly on written material, which meant that the majority of what was written down was uh, religious texts, 
historical documents, bookkeeping, all inscribed painstakingly by hand, mostly in monasteries. But with the printing press, the rising middle class was better equipped to read, to write, disseminate secular literature, poetry, plays, reflections on human matters like love, death, suffering, injustice. And it's here that the individual begins to emerge in art, not the individual as an emblem of uh, an archetype, an embodiment of this or that vice or virtue, not a religious figure, but as rounded real people with dreams, hopes, aspirations, with complexity. If you compare, say, the epics of Homer with the tragedies of William Shakespeare, I think you can see some of the logic of progress that I've been talking about. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, which I love, by the way, Tragically flawed men are driven to ruin by the whims of the gods. But in my favorite Shakespearean tragedy, Romeo and Juliet, two young lovers are driven to mutual suicide because of a senseless vendetta between noble families. And it's a complex and many-sided story. It's about love, it's about family, it's about revenge, it's about fate. But the gods don't come into it, really. They're referenced here and there, but the whole story would work without them. This is a purely human story. Now, after the Reformation, the bourgeois, with their burgeoning capitalist system and their personal relationship to God, to Protestantism, they were striving to be more than mere subjects. They wanted to go their own way to enrich themselves, both figuratively and literally. And this prepared a major breakthrough in art, a leap forward that lasted hundreds of years. Most artists, up until around the 14th to 16th century, are actually unknown to us as individuals. They were basically just servants called upon by, by wealthy people to produce stuff for them or the church. But around this time, during the Renaissance, individual uh, great artists begin to appear to us and their subject matter starts to change, becomes much more in touch with everyday life. Um, so in the aftermath of the Dutch Revolution, a bloody affair in which the Netherlands broke away from Spain, comes my favorite painter. And I think, uh, in my humble opinion, the greatest portraitist in history, Rembrandt. And he painted nobles, common folk, brothel goers, and a huge volume of painstakingly honest self-portraits showing the artist from youth to old age, in sickness, in health, joy and sorrow, capturing the whole gamut of human experience. And I defy the most stony-hearted among you not to be touched by the paintings of his wife while she was dying from tuberculosis. He felt compelled to capture this genuine experience. This is a bourgeois artist reflecting the world as he really saw it, not as the church or lord told him it should be, concerned with life in this world, not just in the next one. Now, the French Revolution of 1789 and its aftermath were a major inspiration to bourgeois artists, although I have to say mostly outside of France, at least initially. Uh, the Romantic poets in Britain were heavily influenced by the French Revolution, both politically and as a source of artistic inspiration. Um, the British Romantic poet William Wordsworth was actually a first-hand witness to the French Revolution, and he provides a particularly vivid portrayal of the Revolution in his semi-autobiographical preludes. I think this is actually one of the best depictions of the Revolution in terms of capturing the essence of it and how it feels. He says, "'Twas in truth an hour of universal ferment. Mildest men were agitated, and commotions, strife of passion and opinion filled the walls of peaceful homes with unique sounds. The soil of common life was, at that time, too hot to tread upon. Now, unfortunately, the bourgeois radical can only go so far, and most retreated into pessimism with the uh, Bonapartist counter-revolution in France. Wordsworth actually went further than most. He became an apologist for the brutality of the British states, for which he was uh, rewarded with a laureateship by Robert Peel. Uh, if you read young William Wordsworth with old William Wordsworth, they are different people. Uh, it, it's one of the biggest falls from grace in artistic history, in my opinion. Um, and there are notable exceptions, such as the other great romantic poet, Percy Shelley, who remains a radical Republican until his death, uh, Burns as well. And in Vienna, in my view, the greatest composer in history, Ludwig van Beethoven, supported revolutionary politics, even as he continued to revolutionize music, right up until the end. At one time, 
he actually had illusions in Napoleon Bonaparte as, uh, you, as an enlightened liberator in Europe. But such was his righteous fury after Napoleon declared himself emperor, that he scratched his name from his dedication to the Eroica Symphony with such force that it tears a hole in the page, which remains to this day. I think it's one of the most striking and powerful images of revolutionary spirit expressed through art, that hole in the Eroica dedication. And as it is, the Eroica is dedication to the French Revolution, uh, to nameless revolutionary, which I think makes it a lot more powerful. That's the point of our revolution, right? It involves everyone in society. It's the heroic will of the broadest masses of society to take control of their destiny. And musically, the Eroica is the French Revolution. It's dissonant, it's dramatic. It's about four times longer than any symphony before it. It charts the ebbs and the flows, the victories and the defeats of the revolution, ending in its final movements on this amazing, tremendous, soaring note of optimism for the future. If you haven't heard it, listen to it. It is absolutely incredible. It's one of the greatest pieces of art ever created uh, in human history, in my opinion. And Beethoven had a few of those. But, while exceptional individuals continue to develop art to new heights, as the bourgeois class asserted their control over society and over culture, they increasingly viewed art as something to be exploited for profits or shown off, conspicuously consumed, the term sometimes used, rather than creatively developed. And, of course, the gilded doors of uh, the theatres and concert halls remain firmly closed in much of the world to most ordinary people. Um, most ordinary people couldn't afford tickets to go to the theatre, go to the opera, and so on. And, of course, through imperialism and colonisation, the bourgeoisie looted and destroyed the cultural achievements of every other civilization they encountered. In many parts of the world, the Americas, the Middle East, various uh, former African empires, European invaders encountered very advanced arts. Um, I, I listened to a lead off at the um, International Marxist University uh, by Jorge about the conquest of the Americas, where he talks about the kind of art that was encountered, and it was very advanced. And the European invaders stole this art. They used it to decorate their galleries and museums, uh, much of which remains in uh, galleries and museums to this day. I went to the Natural History Museum uh, a couple of months ago, and I went to the place where they display all the gemstones. And at the back, there's uh, a bunch of carved gemstones. And he says, oh, this one's uh, from India. This one's from Ethiopia. It's like, where, how, how do they appear? Like, ah, oh, let's go talk about that. <laughs> Look at the nice stone. Uh, but this is the point. They, they, they stole the cultural heritage of the civilizations they encountered. And then, through imperialism, they held these societies in states of poverty, of unnatural backwardness, artificial backwardness, which basically stagnated the cultural development of those traditions. Who knows where they could have gone were it not for imperialism, but of course that's now a matter of history. And this, I would say, is the, the fundamental limitation of bourgeois culture. The bourgeoisie want freedom for themselves. They want freedom for them. Uh, freedom to exploit, to, to, to dominate, to enrich themselves, not in the majority. And that means that the bulk of mankind's artist, artistic potential is never utilized under capitalism. Um, there's, there's the quote from Trotsky about how many uh, swine herders are sitting on thrones and uh, how many you know, geniuses died herding swine. I mean, how many Beethovens, how many Mozarts, how many Shakespeare's died in obscurity after working in factories or tilling fields? We'll never know. We'll never know their names. We'll never be able to experience the genius they could have brought to human culture. And that's the tragedy of capitalism, really. That's the tragedy of the endpoints or the impasse of the developments of bourgeois culture. So I would say we live in a contradictory situation today. Capitalism has developed culture to a tremendous degree, tremendous degree. And yet, in my eyes at least, art appears not only stagnant, but that stagnation, I think, is accelerating. Consider cinema, which I regard as the most advanced product of bourgeois art. I'm a bit biased because I was a film student um, many years ago, but I do still think that. Uh, it combines imagery, music, theatre, literature, all into one. And it's only made possible by industrial production, by the mass working class that capitalism brings into being. It mechanically reproduces the world in exacting detail. But what are we doing with this incredible creation? 
rehashing old ideas for the most part. If you look, and I know it's not a perfect measure, but bear with me. If you look at the highest grossing films per year of the last 10 years, so at least showing where the bulk of you know, capital in cultural development is, is invested, five of them are superhero movies, nine of them are based on existing properties, and eight of them are owned by a single company. Anyone guess which one? Disney. Disney, there you go. Uh, House of the Mouse. I'm going to be honest here. I enjoy some of these films. Uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy some popcorn fluff. There's nothing wrong with uh, enjoying the old blockbuster. Some of them are, are perfectly well made as, as, as pieces of uh, popular art. But undeniably, I would say this represents a decline in the general scope of creativity. And it coincides with a monopolization of the industry and a narrowing of the horizons, even of the mainstream. I'll give you an example. During the so-called golden age of Hollywood, where the industry was booming in the 1930s and 40s, the American film industry was like a factory. It pumped out literally hundreds of movies every single year. And you have teams of technicians and actors and directors working on these massive lots, and they come in and out and change the backdrops, and they just produce this, this, this slew of material. Now, not all these films were good, um, but most of them were at least somewhat original, and certainly a greater variety of stories presented. But after the wild successes of Jaws in 1975 and Star Wars in 1977, both of which are films I like, by the way, that number dropped dramatically, and increasingly absurd amounts of money have been concentrated into a handful of so-called tentpole films, propping up the whole industry. And these are usually you know, fairly lowest common denominator spectacle <clears throat> pictures that are meant to be the safest possible investment. They have to be a bit middling, they have to be a bit unchallenging because they have to appeal to the widest possible audience in order not to cost the investors who are paying for the films uh, their money. And today, it's reached such absurd degrees that big movies can be considered a flop if they make less than a billion dollars at box office because investors speculate on this kind of performance. And astronomical marketing budgets to guarantee that before, uh, performance often exceed the budget of making the film itself. We end up in a situation where huge amounts of capital are invested in essentially the same film three or four times a year. Um, and sometimes it goes catastrophically wrong and it results in a knock-on effect which harms the rest of the industry. Um, the, the Tom Hooper adaptation of Cats, for example, that terrifying <laughs> phantasmagoria of uh, Judy Dench as a furry. <laughs> it was such a catastrophe that it had a perceptible knock-on effect on Hollywood risk-taking, creatively, artistically and financially, for the subsequent two years. Films that should have been made were not made, projects were cancelled, jobs were lost because of this terrifying, awful film. <laughs> but Hollywood's gross profits have reached huge levels in the last period. Global box office revenue, um, this is global to Hollywood, rose from $23 billion in 2005 to $43 billion in 2018. It died because of the COVID pandemic, but you know, it's a different thing. Now, Lots of interesting films still continue to be made, mostly on the margins. But even those films are under threat because a shrinking pool of investors are putting more eggs in fewer baskets, if you like, investing more and more in fewer, more reliable projects. And the state bodies that used to subsidize the production of smaller films are easy targets for austerity. The British Film Institute has seen a 10% real-term budget cut this year, and that follows annual real-term budget cuts going back 20 years. And as I was writing this lead-off, the Edinburgh International Film Festival, which is a really important vehicle for independent and crossover projects, collapsed because of, I quote, a perfect storm of reduced audiences due to the pandemic, rising energy bills, and the cost of living crisis, which caused the charity behind it to fold. So the crisis of capitalism literally and materially destroys the basis by which even the more interesting film projects are created. And um, we see the same problem of narrowing horizons and rising private profits in all fields of art. Take music, for example. Now, the invention of radio, recording technologies, mass-produced instruments, and so on, should have been a big impetus to people making and sharing music. And to a large extent, that was the case. 
And in the post-war period in Britain, during the period of capitalist upswing, this was supported by massive investments in states funded art colleges, technical schools, and university courses, from the, uh, which the likes of John Lennon, Ray Davis, Keith Richards, Jeff Beck, Brian Ferry, David Bowie, all benefited. I think that's a good thing. It depends on whether you like those artists, I suppose. <laughs> um, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2016, and there was this superstitious rumour going throughout the press that it was cursed because all these great artists were dying. Uh, no, they all came out at the same period. The reason they all seem to be dying at once is because they were all in the 60s and 70s, took loads of drugs in, in, in the 1960s. They came out of the period where during upswing, the capitalists were investing in culture and the arts to a certain extent. And today, <clears throat> things have started to turn um, radically into their opposites. Platforms like Spotify, streaming services like Spotify, have a functional monopoly on music distribution. They take a big bite of artist revenue, even as labels enforce worse and worse deals on artists to capture more royalties and residuals. I know this for a fact, my brother's a musician. And it used to be the case that your um, cuts to the record label would come mostly out of your sales, and you keep money from merch and from touring. These days, you have to sign what's called a 360 degree deal. What do you think that means? It means the label gets a bit of everything. And it has to, because the labels are struggling, because of digital distribution. So you have the situation where, contradictorily, it's easier for everyone to share their music, but harder to make a living off of it. And you have some of the biggest artists in the world, the ones who are successful, I think, creatively impacted by the problem this contradiction causes. Do you have any Canadians in the room? That's, that's good. Um, because I was listening to the last couple of big Drake projects, and you have these, uh, I'm sorry Champagne Poppy, but you are the embodiment of uh, the crisis of culture under art, uh, under capitalism. You have these overlong artists of weak, underwritten tracks, uh, overlong albums, sorry, of weak, underwritten tracks, expecting people to stick them on background listening playlists, the repetitive hooks, the work well on social media. This is tailor-made to fit the kind of distribution which is most powerful under this period of capitalism, and it directly impacts and undermines the arts made. Now, look, there has always been bad music. There is always going to be bad music. And there's plenty of great music made today. Um, but you can literally measure the declining palette of musical complexity in recent decades. Um, the Artificial Intelligence Institute in Barcelona performed a study, I have a few issues with it, but it's still interesting, performed on about a million songs released between 1955 and 2010. And they were looking at three different musical metrics, uh, timbre, pitch, and loudness. And they found that after peaking in complexity in the 1960s, all three have become more homogenous over time. And this also kind of reflects the logic of capitalism. New musical breakthroughs start in the margins, become popular, capital pours in, and then a thousand imitators are spat out, and the market becomes exhausted. Look at punk, look at hip hop, for example. Genres from the fringes, inspired by anger, by oppression, that became popular, were quickly picked up and commercialized, resulting in an increasing glut of bland material. The introduction of distribution, digital distribution, in music and film is a great example of technological development that should be of massive benefit to art, but becomes a fetter. Through services like Netflix, you can easily imagine how any sane society could put the entire sum output of visual media in one place, available all over the world, at the press of a button. But what you have instead are a handful of services like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, competing for market dominance and forcing you to take out three, four, five separate subscriptions if you want to watch The Sopranos, The Wire, and The Godfather. This is ridiculous. This is, this is literally ridiculous. Meanwhile, workers in these industries endure intensified exploitation. Streaming services have a different arrangement with governments than traditional film and television productions. They're classified as new media, which means they can pay workers on set less, make them work longer hours, pay lower residuals, avoid paying pension or healthcare contributions, and this all was explored, exploded into a full-blown Hollywood strike led by the AXC Union last year. But few modern media industries show the rot and stagnation of art under capitalism quite like video games, in my opinion. We have watched the rapid decline of this industry in the space of just a few years. Now, I'm, about, I'm just over 30. Uh, I'll tell you how much. 
But I'm old enough to remember when games cost £40, they were about 10 to 30 hours of gameplay out of the box, and what you had was a finished product. These days, they're trying to introduce a £70 price tag for disc or download, and the game you buy will be a buggy mess, rush to market, further monetized with addictive loot crates, microtransactions, and DLC, and the actual disc content is usually around five hours. This is literally like inflation or de-inflation of quality. It's, it, it's, um, it's so obvious in the last period. And all the while, workers in this sector are under ever greater pressure to work brutal hours under crunch conditions to get the game to market, working 10, 11, even 12 hour days, six days a week. And the result is this vicious cycle where unreasonable expectations and intense meddling from game publishers who hold the purse strings result in subpar games that see studios disbanded and dozens or hundreds of workers laid off if they flop. One of the biggest game publishers, Electronic Arts, has shut down 14 game studios to date, just chewing them up and spreading them out. All the while, the profits of the capitalists in this sector have never been higher. They're expected to hit $200 billion for the first time this year. And the workers in these industries are only lately beginning to unionize. Up until now, they have been little more than raw material for exploitation. And because of that, it's little wonder that a slew of sleazy scandals and abuse of women has come to light in major games companies like Activision Blizzard and Ubisoft in recent years. But despite all of this, art cannot help but reflect life to a certain extent. And a number of popular pieces of media in the last few years, even in the relative mainstream, from Parasite to Squid Game to Joker, have um, been produced, which reflect a frustration towards the injustice of capitalist society. And they reflected back onto the real world. People were dressing up as the Joker during uh, strikes and protests throughout uh, Europe and the Middle East a couple of years ago. The Lebanese, the, the Lebanese um, protests, I think, were dressing up as the Joker. Squid Game, the costumes from Squid Game were used by striking South Korean workers recently. So the, this anger is finding its way to the surface, uh, to art to a certain extent, even now. But while art and artists can articulate anger with capitalism, they cannot overthrow it. In fact, they are its prisoners. And returning to games for a second, in a recent telling example, again, while I was writing this, the main developers of a really good video game called Disco Elysium, low budget, inspired by Marxist ideas, sleeper hits, whose makers describe themselves as communists, uh, who, when they were accepting their Game of the Year award, dedicated the game to Marx and Engels. <laughs> <laughs> Um, were just a week ago, I think, or two weeks ago, booted out of the company that they founded by the investors they brought on in order to get that game to a bigger market. And it was such a disaster that the country that company was uh, founded in, Estonia, was sent into a minor economic crisis as a consequence. Well, not as a direct consequence, but fed into an economic crisis in that country. So. I think this is a really, this is a really microcosmic, but nevertheless telling example. This is people inspired by Marxist ideas who are really trying to articulate something against capitalism, but the art they create is constrained by the system. And ultimately, it's only the working class that can free art and artists from their chains. So I do believe there is such a thing as progress in art. And I believe there is such a thing as good art. There is a subjective component. I mean, I, I'm sure we can have debates about taste. I'm not going to deny that, and I think that's important. Uh, I'm sure as art, but I like the you won't and vice versa, and that's fine. But I do think there is such a thing as art that is superior. And why can I say this? Well, I think it's based on this metric. Does it tell the truth? Does it say something meaningful and genuine about the world? For art to be true, it must be allowed to follow its own logic. And that's the reason so many films and, and TV shows and games are ruined by investor and publisher and studio interference. Creation by committee and trying to make art fit consumer trends can never be truthful. Equally, I don't really think that propaganda, which is different from political art, can ever be truly great art. It can be good. But I don't think it's ever able to freely express a point of view because it serves a specific purpose. It's tied to a political need. The Bolsheviks understood this. They understood the difference between propaganda and political art and art in general. And in its healthy period, the Russian Revolution <clears throat> imposed very little control over artistic expression. 
But don't take my word for it. I have a quote here by an Oxford historian of Russian, of Russian literature, Max Hayward, who's a reactionary, a conservative, not a fan of the Bolsheviks. And he says the following, the revolutionary censorship's main function was to prevent the publication of overtly counter-revolutionary works. It did not interfere with basic literary freedom in matters of form and content. And this was reversed by the Stalinist counter-revolution because the Stalinists fear everything that they cannot control, uh, which includes creative and, and free expression. The official style of the USSR, adopted, I think, in 1937, I want to say, socialist realism was neither socialist nor realist. It presented a vapid, idealized representation of Soviet society in which the working class was denied any independent voice over its creation. But the market under capitalism has become a far greater obstacle, I would say, to creative expression and development than even the monstrous Stalinist bureaucracy. Because there was good um, art made actually during the Stalinist period, especially in the Eastern Bloc, but maybe again in the discussion. Bourgeois culture as a whole has descended into Philistinism. The ruling class today understands the price of everything and the value of nothing. Look at the way they let the culture sector go to the wall during the COVID-19 pandemic. 120,000 people lost their jobs in Hollywood in a single year. Thousands of theatres, cinemas, music venues around the world closed their doors forever. And last year, the Tories announced a 50% cut in funding to art subjects in schools because these are not proper subjects. They will not get you proper jobs. The bourgeois only care about art for two things. If it can be exploited for profits or if it can be shown off. And this Philistine attitude towards art, I think, is illustrated very eloquently early on by John Doggington, uh, or Dodgington, a landlord and MP in England who put in an order for an opera house box in Venice in 1672, writing with astonishing frankness, seeing as I declare, I do not love music. As regards poetry, I do not esteem it. And I do not understand the theatre. The only reason I ask for this favour is so that I may keep up appearances. My most recent predecessor had boxes, and all the other residents of courts currently have them. And this is about the attitude mm. of the bourgeois coinassaurs coinassaurs of the fine art market today, who chase trends and hoard trinkets for their private galleries. The global value of the fine art market increased from $50 billion to $65 billion between 2020 and 2021. And what sort of work is esteemed by critics in this milieu? The shortlist for the prestigious 2016 Turner Prize included the following. A stack of £20,000 in pennies, a suit made of bricks, and a huge golden sculpture of a pair of buttocks. And to be clear, <laughs> I'm not rejecting experimental or abstract art. You know, Goya, Picasso, posed groundbreaking challenges, uh, Cavell as well, I would say, uh, to the rules of, of their art forms. They all had something profound and interesting to say in breaking with the orthodoxies. But what does a brick suit or a golden bum have to say? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It has no content, no content other than having no content. It seeks to demonstrate that it doesn't care whether it means anything. It literally sells itself on the fact that it is vacuous. It's not simply different to Goya and Picasso, it's worse, it's inferior. It reflects the dead end of bourgeois culture. Art today, in my view, needs to be rescued from capitalism, and that is a revolutionary task. First things first, though, we need to solve the problem of bread. We have to guarantee the basics. Nobody can make good art if they can't feed and house, uh, clothe themselves, if they can't survive. Um, and for as long as art remains the preserve of the wealthy and the middle classes, we can't tap into even a fraction of the artistic potential of humanity. And if we're going to do that, it means we need a socialist revolution. Because by harnessing the full productive capacity of society on the basis of rational planning, we can shorten the working week, 
Shorten the working day. We can make education, including in the arts, free and available to all. We can make access to art free and available to all. We could harness the great strides forwards in cultural development facilitated by capitalism and actually use it to let artists freely create art that, as the chair explained, offers a prism, a reflection of people onto the world. Uh, free from the need to compete and compromise on an open market to survive, artists will be free to make genuinely truthful art. And on the basis of planned production, if you go much further, there will be a harmonization of form and function in the fields of architecture and civil planning under socialism as well. Ordinary people would have the right to live in well-designed, clean, attractive surroundings. But most importantly, by ending the animal struggle for existence, humanity's sights will be raised out of the gutter. This would be a step forward in the subjective development of art that I was talking about, not just the objective development of new techniques and technologies and this sort of thing. Our sights would be raised out of the gutter and we would find new avenues for creative expression that we cannot even contemplate today. In the same way that the Neolithic man could not have imagined the marriage of Figaro, we can't imagine the kind of art, the kind of music, the kind of films, the kind of video games that the communists of the future will be able to create on the basis of the rational planning of society. That is the future we're fighting for. If you care about art, then you care about the socialist transformation of society. Thank you very much.